because that's why we have gathered today to celebrate that uh, sweetest name, the Word of God becoming flesh, living among us, and make a way for us to live with Him forever. Uh, if you would, just by way of a few announcements and reminders, uh, we have a candlelight service tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, it won't be very long, it's about half an hour. Uh, we'll sing. Uh, we've got a special song, uh, a little dramatic monologue, uh, the uh, stepdad of Jesus. Joseph might show up, from what I understand. And of course, lighting the Advent candles and uh, lighting each other's candle. And uh, it's a very beautiful symbolic uh, program. So please come back out for that tonight, 6 o'clock, here in the sanctuary. And uh, we'll be done by 6.30. After that, my family and I are heading to Lumberton to see family and to be with them tomorrow. Uh, we'll be back probably Wednesday evening or Thursday. So uh, we won't have Bible study, prayer meeting, all of those regular weekly events. Uh, just enjoy your time, travel, be safe. Uh, we know some of our regulars are already with family. Our family's here with them. That's why they're not with us or they are traveling. And so we just uh, ask you to be safe and enjoy the holiday. And we will resume next Sunday. Uh, next Sunday, though, uh, won't have youth. They decided, and I forgot to tell Faye, this was on me. Uh, they decided to have New Year's Eve uh, as a, a break, and uh, we weren't sure exactly what was happening. So next Sunday, uh, no youth meeting, but then in January, we'll start our regular uh, schedule again. Okay. Um, the rest is prayer requests. Any other announcements? Anything is a time before the church? Let's open up with a word of prayer. Holy Father God, we do thank you for this day you have given us. Lord, we thank you for this holiday season that we uh, make special because we celebrate your birth. We celebrate the time that you came, you became a man and came to this world and lived among us. You lived a life that was perfect and sinless, even though you were tempted and tried in every way like people are. Because you were fully a person, and yet you remain fully God, both at the same time. And, and that boggles our mind is so wonderful. Uh, we, Lord, your salvation is so wonderful, and you came here to offer it to us. So we thank you. Uh, I pray, Lord, that in the midst of traveling and family and fun and fellowship and, and, and gift giving and eating and all these things we do to celebrate, which are wonderful. Help us to keep our mind and heart focused on you as the foundation of this season. And you are why we celebrate. And I pray, Lord, that that would bring us the greatest joy. We ask that you be here with us today and our candlelight service tonight, that our worship would be pleasing to you. And we ask, Lord, I ask that you would bless these folks here and all of our members and church family that can't be here today, that you would be with them, bless them, and keep them close to you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Now, my family has the honor of lighting the Advent candle for this week. So, uh, the Davis is wood. Please come down and forward. We're scattered kind of all over the place.
Uh, this is from Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place when Caelinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the time of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go off to Bethlehem and see what has happened, the Lord has, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had see, seen him, they spread off to the world, concurring. They spread the word. They spread the word, concurring what had been told. What they had been, what had been told them about this child, and who heard it were amazed at what hap, hap, at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all those things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, so just as they had been told. On this most holy day, we light all four candles in our Advent wreath, and we are reminded of the expectation preparation proclamation and revelation of his coming. Now we light the Christ candle. We rejoice that the promise of God has been fulfilled in the coming of the baby born in a manger. Gracious and mighty King, we celebrate your goodness to us as we join the triumph and joy of Christmas. As your love has been revealed in all its fullness, we pray that love may abound in our hearts during this special day. Grant us the spirit of Christ that we may live in the fullness of his character every day. And in his name we pray, amen. First hymn, our hymn of praise this morning is hymn number 111, Sing We Now of Christmas. Let's sing all five verses. It kind of tells a story, the Christmas story through song. So let's not leave out the angel of the shepherd and the wise man and sing all five verses of hymn 111.
who have just lost loved ones, who have family members that they don't expect to see many more days. Uh, this will be their last Christmas if they make it that long. Lord, we have those who are just suffering regular illnesses like COVID and the flu and things like that that keep them from enjoying this time and being around their family. We pray, Lord, that you would be with all of those who are sick, shut in, hospitalized. Give them grace. If it be your will, give them health and strength and healing of body. But Lord, Lord, we pray mostly that you give them uh, peace and grace and strength that comes from knowing you and being with you and in your presence. You can be with them not only around the, the Yuletide and the Nativity and the fireplace, you can be with them in the hospital place. You can be with them in the hours of grieving, the prayer closet. You are always with us. And we thank you, Lord, for that, that you are God with us. So Emmanuel, our Christ, we give you praise. We ask that you would bless and be with these that we love and know who are hurting and need you especially at this time. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Operatory hymn is hymn number 98. This is another one we need to sing all five verses because it tells a story. The singer is pondering and going through doubt and wondering about how this Christmas message can really apply to the world as messed up as it is. I think we can relate to that. But he gets reassured and he comes back with a stronger faith at the end. So seeing every verse and think about the story that this speaker is going through and how it, uh, it still applies to us today. Let's sing all five verses of hymn 98. <laughs>
kids who are about ready to go to Children's Church, you just follow Miss Amanda now. You are excused. The rest of you, if you would, join me in the Gospel of Matthew, first chapter. Matthew chapter 1. We're starting with verse 18, Matthew 1, 18. The reading from the NIV. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. And you can imagine, right? Here he is, engaged, betrothed to this young lady, and she's pregnant. He knows it's not his, so he makes the only natural assumption. And still, he wants to treat her well and not disgrace her publicly, or at least as little as possible. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you, will, you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel. Which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus, which in Hebrew means God saves. And I want us to notice in these seven verses, we have the fact that Mary is a virgin emphasized four times. Uh, verse 18 gives it to us twice. Uh, she was found to be pregnant before they came together. She was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit, not from a man. The angel said what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit in verse 20. Verse 23, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. This was the prophecy in Isaiah. And then in verse 25, they did not consummate their marriage until after Jesus was born. The virgin birth of Christ is a very important part of understanding who Jesus is. It's a very important part of the Christmas story. It's the, the miraculous aspect of the story. There are signs in the heaven that the wise men interpreted. They went to the west to meet the king of the Jews. There were angel appearances to the shepherds. And all those are wonderful. But the most miraculous part is that Mary had never been with a man. But that's a vital part because it establishes for us the, the nature of Jesus. I remember when I was a teenager hearing that uh, somewhere, I forget where in the world, there was actually a woman who had some kind of weird genetic thing going on and she actually created in her womb a clone of herself. She, a, a virgin had a baby. But it was a genetic clone of herself. It was a girl. And so that's hyper rare. I've never heard of that from anywhere else. But even that could not have produced somebody like Jesus. To have a boy, you need to have a Y chromosome. She had never been with a man. There was no biological way she could have a boy child and be a virgin. So either we got to say the Bible is wrong, or we got to say Jesus, his very life was a miracle. Because he was born of a woman. He was a boy child with no biological father. He was created. His human body was created in Mary. Now I want to make that distinction. Jesus has always been 
Always is, always will be. He is the mind, just like the Father, just like the Holy Spirit. But that body was created by God and put in Mary. He became flesh and lived among us. That's John chapter 1. In the first several centuries of the church, especially after Christianity became a recognized legal religion in the Roman Empire, the major debates, the councils, and the meetings that the church had was to discuss and to determine what the official stance would be on the nature of Jesus. Because there were some heresies and some orthodox teaching, and they had to determine what was right, what was biblical, what wasn't. And some of the theories about the nature of Jesus were what had to be dealt with, and some cast out as uh, heretical. Because according to Greek philosophy, which these learned men were steeped in, matter, flesh, was lower, it was less, it was wicked to a lot of them, compared to spiritual things and mental things. And so the idea that God, holy and divine God, could be in a body was just disgusting to them. Right? You can't bring God down and put him in something that is lowly and wicked and, and fallible like the body, even though the body itself was a wicked thing. Well, the church father said, but the Bible tells us that Jesus had a body. He, he was born. He, he, he touched people. They could feel the scars uh, from the crucifixion after he came back to life. He ate with them. He, he touched people that he healed. He had a physical body. He existed as a person in a physical body. Some thought that God uh, appeared. He just uh, was a vision. Again, but it was a physical body. We could touch it. One wild theory said that God possessed a guy named Jesus. And that's when Jesus became the Christ. And then once he was about to die, God left him because God can't die. He said, well, if God didn't die for us, then the salvation doesn't work. And so see, we've got to have a miraculous born God who is both divine and man. That's who Jesus is. The, the Gospel of John puts it this way. In the beginning was the Word. Now the Word is a Greek idea, this logos. It is the, the thing that took all of the, the primal energy and Greek understanding and made it into an organized, structured, created, tangible thing. So the idea that John's getting at is in the beginning... There, there is God and there was with God and who was God, the, the creative force, the thing that kind of translates God for us and makes God understandable to us. And John says that's Jesus. Jesus is the most accurate, most intelligible presentation of who God is that mankind could ever understand because he is God made flesh. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, as Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So Jesus was not created. Everything that was ever created was made by the Father and by Jesus. And if you remember Genesis 1, the Spirit moved over the waters before everything was made. So the Spirit was there. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, none of them were created. But through whom, through them, all things were created. John's prologue ends in verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So God became a person. He dwelled as an embryo inside Mary in her womb until she gave birth. And then he lived a human life and yet was still God. Fully man, fully God. Combined into one person of Jesus Christ. Now this is, like I said, from the beginning of church history when they can get together, they establish this as their understanding of Christ because it's what the Bible tells us about him. 
So it's an old doctrine, but it should still blow your mind. This person was also God in the flesh, but he was completely a person. He was born to a virgin. He could not be born to two human parents because then he would just be a, a guy. He would just be this dude who told us things and say it said he was God and blasphemed and his usual right to put him to death. A lot of people want to say Jesus was just a good teacher. You, you can't. Because he taught he was God. He taught things like no one can come to the Father but through me. He taught things like before Abraham was 2,000, 2,500 years before Jesus was born. Before Abraham lived, I am. Evoking the name of God, the eternal existence of God. And his, his audience, his contemporaries, they understood that. He was claiming to be eternal, claiming to be God because they picked up stones to stone him for blasphemy. That's really your two options. Well, three. He could be a lunatic. He's just a lunatic. And lunatics don't make good teachers. He's lying about who he is because he's an egomaniac. Again, not really a good teacher, an old body. Well, he's God made flesh and lived among us. And so yes, he's a good teacher. His words are the very words of God. Who lived among us. Who taught us. He took on all that it means to be a human being when he was born. We, we love this story. We love this time of year, right? We think that that perfect little baby. But unlike everybody else, that perfect little baby grew up to be a perfect man. The only guy, the only girl would ever do that. He grew up to still be a perfect person. The Bible tells us in Hebrews he was tempted in every way like we are, yet he never sinned. So he had man's body, he had a man's mind, he had a man's will, but he also had the will of God. He had a man's spirit, but he also had the Holy Spirit with him. He also was divine. So he never sinned. See, he, his very incarnation is telling us something that those Greeks didn't understand. That the human body isn't by nature sinful, evil, and dirty. It simply is. It's the decisions that we make and do with it that make us sinful or not. God created all of matter. So the earth, stuff, bodies, none of those are inherently evil our decisions. And so Christ, tempted in every way that we are, made every right decision. He never sinned. He showed us what it was like to live in perfect obedience to God. He fulfilled all the law. He fulfilled all the will of God throughout his life. And so he makes us remember that the body, which was created in Genesis chapter 2 in the image of man, I'm sorry, chapter 1. The image of man. Okay. Man who was made in the image of God in Genesis chapter 1. Wow. Don't tell those ancient church fathers. I'm just here to gratify the But the human body made in the image of God could contain the Word of God made flesh. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So there's nothing inherently evil about the human body. Jesus inhabited one. And so the human body can be redeemed through Christ. The human will, Christ had one. He redeemed it by dying and coming back to life, by serving God and obeying Him. The human soul and spirit, He had one. He redeemed them by dying and coming back to life. Everything that is to be human, Jesus can redeem because He took on everything that is to be human. And so he redeems not only our souls, he can redeem the body, he can redeem the will, he makes our will, if we let him, more in line with God's, like his was. His Holy Spirit comes in us and changes our spirit, our will, our motivation, it enlightens our mind, enlightens our minds. Everything that is to be human, Jesus took on self so he could bless and enhance and cleanse everything that is to be human in each one of us. 
And this is the Christian, the Christmas message. The virgin gave birth to a boy who was Emmanuel, God with us. But he wasn't just God in our presence, he was God as one of us. There was a song in the 90s, I think it was Alanis Moore said, what if God was one of us? And it goes on, it's not Christian, it goes on like, what if he was just a slob like one of us? What if he was just a jerk like one of us? Well, he was one of us, but he was the best possible person ever. Because he was sinless. Because he always obeyed the Father. Because he loved people. He taught them God's ways. He was one of us and still remained God. Somehow. And because he was one of us, he could take on our sin. He, he lived one of our lives and he, he always chose the right thing. He never gave him temptation, but he was tempted. And he could then take on our sin. And he fulfilled the law of God, but he gave that fulfillment, that acceptance to us. He offers it to you and to me freely. That's his offer of salvation. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might have the righteousness of God. So the manger is always about the cross. Without the cross, there was no point. There was no point in him coming. But if he didn't come like he did, born of a virgin, God made flesh, and he couldn't do what the cross set out to do. He would just be a, a guy wrongfully killed by another corrupt government. No offense, but there's been billions of those. But because he was God made man, lived a perfect life, died willingly in our place, even though he could call him angels and get himself out of that predicament. He willingly laid down his life to save you, to save me, if we would have it. That's the Christmas story. That's what I hope you remember tomorrow. That's what I hope you remember on the 26th and the 27th and the 28th and New Year's Day and all of 2024. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the story. That's the point. That's what I want us to remember. And if you've never accepted that truth, it, it's the Christmas story, but it's not fiction. It's the true story. My favorite author is, is J.R.R. Tolkien. You know, I love the Lord of the Rings. And he told his friend, C.S. Lewis, you probably heard of him. He, he was a Christian apologist. He wrote the Narnia stories for kids. He was a prolific Christian writer and teacher. Tolkien helped him become saved. And he said, this is the only true myth in the world. The story that explains why we are and who we are, it gives us our purpose, and it's the only one that ever actually would have happened. It's a true story, not based on a true story, not Hollywood fictionalized, the true story of God who came to live here. And we celebrate it tomorrow and hopefully every day after. If you haven't accepted that as your, has accepted him as your Savior, this isn't part of your story. Then come and accept it and be part of that kingdom. Have that everlasting life. It's a free gift. Just like the ones you want to get tomorrow, just like you want to give to people and you never expect them to pay you back, you don't expect them to do anything more. It's just, I love you. Here, have this, please. I thought of you when I saw this. He saw us in our state and said, I, I want you to have this. I want you to have this righteousness that I've always intended for you to have. And you can't do it on your own. So I'm going to give it to you. Accept it. But it changes you from the inside. Because that new spirit doesn't mesh well with the old spirit. And you've got to 
You've got to help it win the battle for your heart. If you need to make a decision about that, accepting that, or you just want to come forward and pray, pray for someone you know who is still lost and hasn't accepted him, or maybe you just want to give thanks to God and come and pray, maybe you want to join the church, whatever God's putting on your heart, we're going to sing, Go Tell on the Mountain. Great Christmas song. Jesus is born, so let's tell people. Let's tell them laugh. But while they sing, if you want to come and accept that message, come. If you want to come pray, I'll pray with you if you want. You can just pray here by yourself if you want to. But everyone else will sing hymn 95. Go tell them tonight.